Welcome to The Dark Divide, a podcast that takes a seat, dangles its legs over the edge, and stares into the abyss. This is the story of Grace Mullane. You had an itch to get lost, knowing it'd be how you found yourself. You'd read books by people who couldn't quiet the wanderlust within themselves. Cut from the same cloth, maybe. You also had maps beneath your skin. You were learning that to be daring often meant being rewarded. If you could find prize in the simplicity of mundane moments in a place you've never been, you'd see the ordinary still held an element of magic to it. Somehow everything seems different, brand new or better. The way people make small talk, the taste of coffee from a cafe on the corner, the tiny bottles holding vanilla scented shampoo in your hotel room. Everything is just so alive and one of a kind. And you, too, become new with each destination. It's like there were versions of you tucked away beneath napkins and matchbooks, waiting in taxi cabs and airports. You'd hold your breath sometimes like it could freeze a moment so you wouldn't have to let it go and move on to the next. Forever in a day, right in the palm of your hand. Sometimes you wanted to stay right there for always, in the middle of your very own moving postcard. Grace gave herself one more look over before heading out of her hostel suite. She chose the black skater dress and her sneakers. She wanted to look cute, but this was the fanciest it was going to get out of what she'd packed. Her Tinder date had convinced her to meet up for a little birthday eve celebration the night before. I know a cool Mexican place that does cocktails. No to the Mexican, but maybe to the cocktails, Grace replied. I know a few places that do great cocktails. How about we meet at Sky City? Uh, I haven't said yes yet. Well, you haven't said no either, smile, so what's it going to take to make this happen then? Convince me, Grace says with a cheeky emoji sticking its tongue out. Well, my shout? Ha ha ha. What? I'll buy the drinks, my shout? He was cute and persistent. Grace agreed and gave him her full name so he could add her on Facebook Messenger and they could arrange details for meeting up the next day. She'd only been in Auckland for two days and was excited at the idea of a cute boy to play tour guide for the evening. She was looking forward to seeing nightlife here. It was one of the things she already found herself missing about school. All those fun nights with friends at uni, taking shots, dancing, and staying up until dawn talking about the rest of their lives. Grace had just spent the last ten days traveling the Upper North Island, and it was safe to say she'd fallen in love with New Zealand. Before that, she spent a few weeks in Peru, hiking with travelers who became fast friends, making memories that would bond them for a lifetime. She'd love the contrast of ancient ruins to a busy and bustling city in a matter of just a few days. Life was so vast, and yet so small at the same time. She wanted to experience it all. Her September graduation back home in Essex had been the kickoff for a gap year, which she intended to spend traveling to some of her top destinations that she'd been daydreaming about for what felt like forever. A passion effortlessly passed down from her parents, Jillian and David, who loved the chance to travel as a family. Grace had already seen the likes of Ibiza, California, the Grand Canyon, and New York City. And here she was, on the eve of her 22nd birthday, out in the world on her own, seeing the rest of it. She walked out of the hostel into the warm rain. There was something about travel that made her more nonchalant about the weather. She embraced it. She had been caught in the rain a hundred inconvenient times back home, but this was different. Who knew when she'd feel the New Zealand rain on her skin ever again? And would it ever feel like this? She hadn't even bothered to take a jacket. It was warmer than she was used to for December, and as she let the water beat down on her uncovered arms, she felt beautiful. There had been fleeting moments during her travels like this, where she would glance at her own reflection as she passed a shop and be surprised to catch not a girl, but a woman looking back at her. Grace arrived at Sky City a bit early, an entertainment complex in the business district, and it was a typical December scene. People carrying shopping bags, holiday music playing through unseen speakers, the sparkle of lights on strings that wrapped a giant Christmas tree. 
She loved this kind of energy and stood there soaking it all in. While she waited, she sent a photograph to her parents. Her mom loved a good tree, and she knew that they were missing her, it being the holiday season and her birthday. But they were also the kind of parents that never held her back, always supporting whatever interests she wanted to nurture. It was one of the things she loved the most about them. She was about to send a message on Facebook to let her date know she'd arrived when she spots him. He's clean cut, in a light blue jacket, dark jeans, and dress shoes, that I'm trying but not trying casual kind of look, and she likes it. He grins as he walks over to her. They hug quickly in that nervous, awkward way, and she notices how great he smells. He looks cuter than his picture, and her stomach does a tiny flip. She can tell he's happy too, and honestly, more confident than she's used to right off the bat. He suggests a bar called Andy's on the second level of the complex, and they walk towards the direction he points off to. A cute guy, a few pints, and a city to explore. This is what she loved the most about new places and people. Everything was so electric and lively. She felt herself smiling big, the butterflies in her stomach dancing. This would be a birthday to remember. We begin tonight with a public appeal for missing British backpacker Grace Mullane. A short time ago, police held a press conference to appeal for sightings of the 22-year-old who has not been seen since 7.15pm on Saturday night. The alarm was raised when Grace's family in the UK couldn't make contact with her for her birthday last Sunday. It wasn't like Grace to not call home. It certainly wasn't like her to not pick up, especially on her birthday. It would take almost two dozen people to comb through the CCTV footage, but within days, what happened to Grace after she left her room that night would play out like some modern and grotesque film noir. Pieced together frame by frame, street by street, everything fell together like a rotten puzzle, and soon it would be clear to authorities exactly what happened those early days of December 2018. We begin at the Base Backpackers Hotel on December 1st at 5.37pm, where Grace is seen leaving her hostel. She's wearing a black dress, Converse shoes, a small purse. Her brown hair is down, falling just below her shoulders. She keeps a good pace as she turns onto the street and walks straight on. We see her arrive at Sky City, where she stops to take a photograph of the Christmas tree and then waits. It's around this time that the footage cuts to a man at the Bluestone Room around 5.40 p.m., a pub just a short distance away from where Grace is. He's got a dark shirt with an open light blue jacket, black jeans, dress shoes. He finishes up his beer at the stand-up table outside of the bar and then heads off towards the direction of Sky City. It's at 5.45 when we see Grace and this man, her Tinder date, hugging hello quickly. They begin laughing, talking, no doubt shaking off those first meeting jitters. He points into the direction of a bar called Andy's and they walk off together. It then cuts to Andy's. They order drinks at the bar and take a glance at the menu. His movements make it obvious that he's paying, as he talks with his hands punctuating his sentences, one holding his credit card the entire time. They order a few things, several drinks and some tequila shots. They leave Andy's at 7.12 p.m. and decide to go to a nearby Mexican cafe. They arrive moments later. He walks in and motions to the waitress as if to ask if they're able to sit in the back. She nods and her and Grace follow him to an unseen table. They order margaritas by the pitcher and split jugs of sangria together for another hour. At 8.24 p.m., Grace and her date appear again as they walk over to the bar to pay. He's holding his card, waving it around as he talks to the waitresses. Grace gives him a gentle touch to his lower back and heads off to the bathroom. When she comes back, he's finishing up paying. The host asks Grace if she's enjoyed everything, and Grace nods and says yes, smiling big at her. By 8.30 p.m., we've returned to the Bluestone room with a different view. Grace and her date are sitting on stools with a tiny table to themselves in the corner of a half-packed room. Their faces are close. They occasionally kiss between sentences. He runs his hands through her hair, wraps his arm around her shoulder, and brings her in for more kissing. He touches her face with his hands, they're deeply engaged with one another, eyes locked and barely breaking a stare, just occasionally taking a little room between them to get some air. 
At 8.56, he kisses her, rubs her back, and then walks off. She brings a glass and straw to her mouth and gulps the last of it, takes her phone out of her purse and starts to reply to messages. There's one on Facebook Messenger from her friend Amina. She tells her she's out on a date with a guy who's a manager at an oil company. He's cute and he's funny, and he lives in a swanky hotel. Impressive for a 26-year-old, who even knew people lived in hotels. You have to go to his apartment in the hotel. I bet it's like on the top floor, Amina tells her. Literally, I just click so well with him, Grace replies. I'll let you know what happens tomorrow. When her date returns, she takes the opportunity to go to the bathroom while he watches her stuff. And that he does. While she's gone, he rummages through her purse. By 9.40 p.m., the two are tipsy and touchy, walking down the street. He rests his arm on her shoulder where hers comes up to meet his, their fingers interlaced, her other arm around his waist. To an outside eye, they look familiar and happy. They enter the City Life Hotel, and he's clumsy at first, forgetting he has to swipe his access card in order to make the elevator work. He presses the button for the third floor and braces his core as he wobbles back and forth, slowly sliding the card into his wallet. The two walk off into the hallway towards his room. This is the end of the night, the last we can view of their date, and the last time Grace Mullane will ever be seen alive. The following morning around 8am, her Tinder date, looking tired and most likely hungover, gets into the elevator, alone, making a quick and direct nervous glance at the camera before pressing the lobby floor button. He's in a black t-shirt, blue jeans and sneakers, walking out of the hotel and through the atrium to a store called The Warehouse. He walks over to a roller luggage display, picking one up and eyeing its size, but puts it down and grabs a bigger one. He heads over to the counter and checks out. By 8.14, he's back to his hotel room, where he stays until 8.32, when he heads out again to a grocery store called Countdown Metro, where he purchases cleaning supplies, rubber gloves, garbage bags, and a pack of gum at the self-checkout. He heads back to the hotel, gets to his room by 8.40, and stays there for two hours. That's when the footage switches to a cab that he gets into around 10.35. He's fidgety, touches his face a lot, and makes eye contact with the camera, looking uneasy. Just a slow Sunday after a night of partying, a kind of quiet plenty of taxi drivers are used to. He gets the cab to take him to Apex Car Rental, and by 11 a.m., he's rented a vehicle, drives into the hotel parking lot, and goes back to his room upstairs, staying there for four hours. Around 3 p.m., he leaves the hotel and heads to a bar called Revelry, orders a drink, and sends a text message on his phone to the woman he's meeting. He finds her sitting at a patio table outside, and they have drinks together until 5.40. There is, of course, no sound, but later, the details of the Tinder date will surface. The woman will recall a date only memorable for its strangeness. He'd come to New Zealand from Australia with an impressive and successful background in sales to look after his sick grandmother. He told her about his apartment in the hotel that he was living in long-term, which she knew was no cheap expense. He explained to her he'd spent the morning shopping for luggage, something big enough to fit all his sports gear. He then rambled on about how he didn't know a lot of people in Auckland, but he'd happened to have made friends with a lot of police officers. He was even close with a Crown Prosecutor. He told her an obscure story about a guy who'd asked his girlfriend to have rough sex with him, which involved strangulation, but it had gone wrong. She'd died and he'd ended up in jail for manslaughter. The woman was actually a journalist who'd sat in on a few trials, including one for murder. She took this as an opportunity to share her experiences, but he just continued on about himself, seeming to have empathy for the man in that situation. He also told her that he heard the police were having a tough time at the moment because a lot of bodies were going missing in the Waitakere Ranges, and police dogs are unable to sniff out bodies deeper than four feet in the ground. She didn't mind intense topics for first day conversation, but this was a little overboard. It made her uncomfortable. It didn't sit right with her. And as they were leaving, he asked her which direction she was heading off in and she lied, in order to walk the opposite way he was. Later that day, he sent her a message asking to see her again, to which she replied, no thank you. Between 7 and 8 o'clock, he changes into jogger pants, heads somewhere with the rental car, and then returns by 8.15 to head back to Countdown again, and speaks with an employee to rent a carpet cleaning machine. He spends some time in his hotel room, and then by 9.30pm, he gets into the elevator, pushing a trolley with the luggage he bought earlier. It appears full, as he's struggling to push and pull the weight of it. He takes the luggage to his car and returns the trolley to the front desk, joking and motioning with his hands to the concierge about the struggle to keep it from toppling off. 
The CCTV footage continues on to the next day, December 3rd, around 6.30 a.m. The man is in a black hoodie, sneakers, and some gray pants. He's walking around a hardware store, where he pays in cash for a few things, including a shovel. Around three hours later, the footage picks him up returning to the hotel. He has a duffel bag, a bottle of water in hand. He's changed into a maroon-colored shirt, and he isn't wearing any shoes. Twenty minutes later, he leaves the hotel room and is back in the elevator with a black garbage bag that appears full and a black reusable shopping bag. He's changed into jeans, dress shoes, and a black polo shirt. He arrives at Mint Dry Cleaners around 9.58 a.m., handing the reusable black bag to a woman at the counter for services. He makes another stop to buy more luggage before going through a car wash around 10.35, making sure to also thoroughly rinse and clean the rental's interior. He leans the shovel he bought the day before against a wall and drives off. An hour later, he's back in the elevator wearing jeans, a white shirt, a gray jacket, and dress shoes. He looks showered and alert as he checks his reflection in a tiny slice of mirror. At 3.20 p.m., he's back at Mint Dry Cleaners. He hands the cashier a black duffel bag full of more clothes to be cleaned and grabs the reusable bag he had brought there before. He returns to the hotel and stays there until just before 5, when he goes to Albert Park. With a duffel bag hanging off his shoulder, he walks over to a public waste bin and quickly tosses the contents out. By December 5th, Grace is officially reported missing by her parents, and the media notifies the public in order to seek out information about the British backpacker. Photographs of Grace will be on television screens everywhere, the recent graduate in her cap and gown beaming and bright with innocence and excitement. But it won't be until December 6th when authorities will finally locate the man in the footage, the one who'd left a comment on her Facebook profile picture, calling her beautiful and radiant the day before she went missing. But at this point, all they knew was that he was probably the last person to see Grace Mullane. When Grace remained unreachable after her birthday, her parents knew something was wrong. On December 5th, Detective Scott Beard spoke with the media, mentioning to Radio New Zealand that they didn't have any reason as of yet to suspect foul play. They shared an image of Grace in the Mexican cafe from the CCTV footage, saying that they had staff piecing it together to figure out the rest of her night. However, behind the scenes, authorities were closing in on Grace's last movements that night. Between the Facebook interaction and the CCTV footage, police were able to locate the man that Grace had gone on the Tinder date with and brought him in for an interview on December 6th. He came across unbothered about the fact that she was missing and he was most likely the last person to see her alive. Detective Ewan Settle sat across from him, penning down his answers, which he found to me a little more than off. He explained that they'd matched on Tinder and he'd chosen a bar in public at Sky City for his own safety. Um, and then uh, we met at Sky City and then we decided that we were going up to Andy's Burger Bar. Um, which is on the first floor. Hmm. Whose idea was it to go to that particular burger place? Me. Because I knew I, I didn't initially know that she was real. What do you mean? Well, there's a lot of... So have you heard of catfish? No. So catfishing is where someone uses your profile, or uses your photos and pretends to be you and then meets, and you're a completely different person. Um, and it's on Tinder, it's all about the way you look. Um, and so if they use more endearing photos, um, you're more likely to swipe for them. Okay. Yeah. How does, it, how does meeting in a public place sort of protect you from meeting someone who's not as good looking as... Well, there's security there. So if she wasn't who she said she was, yeah. um, at least in my mind, I'd feel safe. Unfortunately, after a great date, he woke up hungover and saw that Grace had unmatched him the next day. He was no stranger to being drunk and disorderly, to having a few too many and singing in bars or falling down in bushes. The concierge had helped him to his room a few times. Maybe they'd even helped him that night of the date he couldn't remember he'd gotten so blind drunk, he told Settle. Maybe he'd done or said something wrong and she didn't want to see him again. Well, how did the night end? We hugged, kissed, said goodbye, and I don't know, she walked off. I started talking to some tourists at the bar. 
Detective Settle explains, without saying as much, that he's a person of interest. This is a serious situation. They fear the worst for Grace, and they aren't sure who is involved, but if he's willing, they'd like to get a DNA sample from him so he can be cleared. The man nods, and the detective leans in and reiterates, When I say foul play, I mean Grace may have been murdered. She may be alive and well, but she may also be dead. And it could be that you've done it, and that's what we need to investigate. When he leaves the room to go notify staff to get the process started, the man knocks on the door and greets Settle with a panic in his voice. Hey, I just want to ask a question. Have I been arrested for something I didn't do? You've been arrested. Oh. Okay. Oh. Oh. Oh, sorry. Holy shit. Settle comes back in saying that they're going to hold off on the DNA for the moment, but they need to inform him of his rights in order to continue the interview. He then goes on to show the man the photograph of him, a still clip from footage in the elevator with the luggage. He taps on the table. That picture is in your hotel. That's on Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. That's you walking in with a suitcase at 8 a.m. I'm telling you, that bag is still in my room. What's in it? Nothing. Nothing's in it. What was in it then? Nothing. Where did it come from? The warehouse. Which warehouse? Uh, Atrium. When did you buy it? That day, because I was going to have to move all my stuff out. I, I, I told you. Okay, no, no. That's not the case. Right? You've told him... You've told him... You've told a lie. What, what do you it's mean? A big, it's a big mistruth. By December 8th, police will alert the public that the case is now being investigated as a homicide, and the man was charged with murder. He explained to police that he had, in fact, spent the night with Grace... They'd had rough sex, and he was so drunk he didn't remember much. He woke up in a tipsy haze, had a shower where he fell asleep, and when he got back into bed, Grace wasn't in the room anymore, so he assumed she'd left. It wasn't until morning that he saw her body on the floor, a stream of dried blood beneath her nose, and realized she'd somehow died. I saw that she was lying on the floor. Um, I saw that she had blood coming from her nose. Um, I, I screamed, I, I yelled out at her and I, I tried to, to move her to see if she was awake. Um, I, I, need, I need to stop. He panicked at how it looked to have a dead body in his room and considered dialing emergency services but didn't follow through. I dialed 111. Um, but I didn't hit the button um, because I I was scared how bad it looked. Why did you think it looked bad? Well, there's a, 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 a dead person in my room. Oh. I thought it looked terrible. Instead, he explained to officers what they already knew from the footage that he decided to shove Grace's body into luggage and bury her. I woke up the next day at about 5am. I ended up driving towards the Waitakeries. I went into the bush. I dug a hole. I went and got the suitcase and I covered the hole. And then I drove. I was just panicking. Did you inflict any injuries on her that caused her to die? Uh, no. Did you kill Grace Mullane? No. Okay. And you're under arrest for the murder of Grace Mullane on or about the 2nd of December. Okay. You understand? Yep. Yeah. Are you ready to take us to where she is? Yeah. Grace's body was recovered on the afternoon of December 9th, around 12 miles west of central Auckland, and examined the following day. Investigations of the area would continue for the week, with police requesting the public to submit any helpful tips, including the whereabouts of the shovel he purchased, which was located on December 13th. They would begin tracking the movements of his rental car, piecing together even more of the CCTV footage, and most importantly, take a deep dive into the man's phone, his life, his past which would reveal the image of a person even more sinister, cold, and calculating than they ever expected.
Word spread like wildfire, and the nation would grit its teeth and question authorities' choices as they waited for the man to be named. The New Zealand courts implemented an indefinite name suppression order, preventing his name and image from being published. The use of a gag order isn't new, especially in a case that's so high profile. It would remain until the courts lifted it, and those who chose not to abide by it would be found in contempt. Many were angry, understandably so, feeling that this temporary call for censorship not only took away the press's freedom, but also restricted information the public felt would be beneficial to know. However, there are also many reasons why name suppression can be helpful and is even necessary. Not only is it useful in protecting the person charged who is not yet convicted in a court of law, but also the people and family members connected to that person. It could also create a massive risk of unfair trial, which defeats the entire purpose of the justice system. The order was only enforced within New Zealand, and to the court's disappointment, some media outlets chose to publish his name, particularly the United Kingdom, understandably feeling no loyalty to a man who'd taken one of their own. Google also included his name in an email sent to subscribers of its trending topics in New Zealand newsletter, which resulted in over 100,000 searches. The new year started off with a feeling of tragic unfairness in the air. Conversations like deflated party balloons. On January 16th, 2019, he would appear in Auckland High Court and plead not guilty to the murder of Grace Mullane. Jury selection of seven women and five men would begin on November 4th, 2019. The entire thing was expected to last around five weeks, but would finish within just three. The man who left the elevator with Grace would remain mostly stoic with defiance. His defense team argued that during the course of the night, he lied to her about his job and finances because of insecurity, nothing more. Eventually, the two had decided upon consensual sex, and Grace had been open about an interest in bondage, discipline, dominance, and submission, sadomasochism or BDSM for short. During a sexual roleplay game, she had asked him to choke her. Unfortunately, this game had gone very wrong. The defense brought up Fintan Garavan as an expert witness, a pathologist who testified that Grace had a lack of defensive wounds on her body, thus proving to be consistent with an act that was consensual. The massive bruising on her neck was only a result of actions she'd invited. He also said that her alcohol levels may have contributed to her death, painting the event as unfortunate and tragic, but not with malicious intent. The defense asked the jury to consider how unlikely it is that this happy young couple would go from swooning in an elevator together to something happening that would cause some angry or violent outburst. No. They'd simply allowed themselves to get out of hand with their risky behavior in the bedroom. When the accused discovered she was dead, he disposed of her body out of panic, not out of planning. He was stricken with a deep fear that nobody would believe him. The earliest known case using the rough sex defense was in 1972, when Carol Califano of Norfolk, England, was killed by her abuser and husband, Peter Drinkwater. In using that defense, his charges were reduced to manslaughter. By the 1980s, the defense was being used in the United States and has remained a controversial practice within the justice system, with many believing the trend to be heavily influenced by the murder of Jennifer Levin, who was strangled by Robert Emmett Chambers Jr., also known as the Preppy Killer. He would be first charged with second-degree murder for what he said was consensual rough sex in New York Central Park. It's also been used in Germany, Canada, Spain, Portugal, Mexico, Sweden, Ireland, and the list continues. We Can't Consent to This, an advocacy group in response to the defense, cites nearly 60 cases where it's been used, often to either lessen charges, have the defendant receive a lighter sentence, or sometimes not even face any legal repercussions at all. The campaign seeks to educate about the dangers of upholding this defense in the justice system, where its severity remains minimized, while also providing education on the risks of strangulation, which is, for instance, more dangerous than waterboarding, an act which is now considered inhumane, because it doesn't just block a person's airway, but strangulation also cuts off blood supply to the brain. The site also explains that consent, something which can be withdrawn at any time, would be impossible if the person lost consciousness, which can happen in as little as four seconds. Even during consciousness, choking can alter brain and mind functioning, causing loss of motor skills or even temporary amnesia. Later, the lead detective Scott Beard would tell Stuff New Zealand during an interview that, rough sex defense, personally, I think it's a cop-out. I think you're just grasping at straws. To strangle someone for five to ten minutes isn't rough sex. And in using that defense, it's just repeatedly revictimizing the family. 
The prosecution would argue that the man not only lied to Grace, but to every person that he came across since the investigation began. He tried to create story after story until he found one that would stick, all of them allowing him to remain a victim of circumstance instead of a cold-hearted killer. The jury viewed the CCTV footage of him calmly going throughout the following day, running errands to carry out the disposal of a woman who had died by his very hands, and taking the time to go out on another date. The jury would also be privy to details about his activity online, giving a haunting timeline of those hidden moments in the hotel room. At 1.29am, he googled areas such as the Waitakere Ranges and Hottest Fire, which the prosecution used to show that his immediate response to what had happened was to dispose carelessly and secretly of her remains. At 1.42am, he searched for pornographic videos online and watched them for three minutes. It is then that the jury is shown photographs of Grace Mullane's dead body in sexually explicit poses, which were taken on his phone between 1.46 and 1.49am. The prosecution explained that this was proof of his fantasy to kill, his morbid fascination with death, and this was a way to memorialize killing Grace in such a heinous manner. He watched more porn from 2.08 to 2.24 a.m. At 7.05, he googled rigor mortis before messaging a woman on Tinder at 7.51, who he would later meet that day for drinks. The prosecutor makes mention of the extra luggage he bought that day as well, as a means to cover his tracks when he told the police he could provide them with the suitcase he was carrying in the CCTV footage. Photographs of luminol staining picked up blood that had been cleaned away in his hotel room, including footprints and smeared stains having appeared to be wiped. There was also heavy blood staining beneath the carpets, which were ripped away. The defense would use testimony from a friend of Grace, who claimed that she and Grace had spoke about boys and sexual preferences, and Grace had mentioned BDSM. A past sexual partner of Grace's from England gave details about how they had researched and participated in BDSM practices. Choking would be done with an open hand from the side, never from the front, and they practiced using safe words and tapping to communicate when they wanted something to stop. The jury would hear an account from a man that Grace had also seen in Auckland the night before that faithful Tinder date. The two met up, watched a movie at his apartment, and after becoming affectionate, eventually had sex. Grace hadn't asked to be choked, and when prompted to describe the sex they had, he said vanilla, meaning regular, nothing involving BDSM. One witness also based in the UK had met Grace on an app called Whippler, which is specifically for people wanting to connect over BDSM and fetish interests. He told the court that he couldn't recall any specific interests that Grace had mentioned, but she seemed to be in an explorative stage in her life, open to suggestion and curious about discovering new things. He did mention that he felt like she was naive and trusting, as when they changed platforms to continue talking, she used one revealing her full name. Users on Whippler and similar apps don't have to give out any personal information at all. It could be any desirable or undesirable person on the other end. She'd also connected with another man on Whippler when she arrived in Auckland, but after a few attempts to reach her when ignored, he'd assume she wasn't interested. The prosecution would also bring evidence forward in regards to the accused and his past experiences with women. All women would remain nameless and faceless throughout the proceedings, one telling the court, I'm depressed and suicidal from months of abuse from this man, explaining that she endured threats and physical assault after forming a relationship with him. In April 2017, she had filed a protection order with the police, and she thought that her nightmare was coming to an end. But when the media released CCTV footage of the missing backpacker, her stomach dropped as she knew the shape of the man with the blurred-out face. I didn't want to bring up my past again, but I wanted the truth to be out, about who he is, the pattern of behavior, and how this whole thing could have been avoided. I will be Grace's voice. Another woman spent several hours telling the jury that they connected through Tinder in March of 2019, went for drinks, and it didn't really go anywhere. In October, they reconnected again via Tinder with a plan to meet up for drinks, and eventually, the two went back to his apartment. They spoke for several hours, drinking and talking about their lives. She told him that she didn't want to have intercourse, but agreed to oral sex, during which he put his full weight on top of her face. She started kicking and hitting him, struggling to breathe. She noted that she's an athletic person. He would have felt what she was doing was an attempt to get his attention. She decided to go limp, thinking maybe he'd become alarmed that something was wrong and stop. He didn't right away. But when he finally did, he asked her what was wrong, and she said that his response was aloof and chilling. The defense challenged her fiercely. They'd gone through 708 text messages between November 2nd and December 3rd. Why reply someone you were afraid of? Maybe instead, 
She'd been pursuing a relationship with him, and when she found out he was connected to this case, she changed her tune. The woman, understandably emotional, said that she was afraid he knew too much about her and her personal life, that maybe something bad would happen if she just ghosted him cold turkey. But she wasn't lying, and refused to allow him to minimize her experience. She was ashamed she'd put herself in an unsafe situation. And when she'd heard about the case, when she'd heard about Grace, she regretted not doing anything. When the court notified her that she would have to continue the next day for more questioning, she broke down crying. One Tinder date testified that they'd met up for sex at his hotel room, and she'd actually told him beforehand that she enjoyed being choked. He did it, notably in a consensual manner, and she said it had been just the right amount of pressure. The jury also heard testimony from a woman who'd never met him in person, but did exchange text messages on Tinder with him. He told her that he was in defeat, strangulation, and dominating. He had contacted her in early December to go out, sometime around the 3rd or 4th, but because of what he'd told her, she said she wasn't interested. After only five hours of deliberation, the jury would return a guilty verdict on November 22, 2019. Murder in New Zealand carries a mandatory life sentence with a minimum period of 10 years before parole eligibility. Judges, of course, have discretion to order a longer period if they see necessary. Sentencing would be scheduled after the holidays. David and Jillian wept, and some of the jury members even wept along with them as the air in the room lifted the tension of what had felt like a never-ending nightmare. It had been nearly a year of travel arrangements and flights, press conferences, media interviews. It was bittersweet to see the end draw near. There had been almost no time to truly mourn the loss of their daughter, and now that's all they would have left. It was time. After their second Christmas without grace, they would once again find themselves seated beneath the harsh fluorescence of the courtroom as the man who'd ripped their daughter out of their lives would be given a minimum sentence of 17 years without parole. By March, he would appeal the conviction. The appeal hearing would take place in August, with the decision of dismissal coming December 18th of 2020. That day, the media had made mention the taxpayers had contributed more than $400,000 in the man's legal aid. It wouldn't be until December 22nd, 2020, that the New Zealand Supreme Court would reject his appeal for continued name suppression. The media would run in a frenzy, finally notifying the public that the man who'd been convicted for the murder of Grace Mullane was Jesse Kempson, a 27-year-old man who had also stood additional trials for separate charges against other women, and subsequently was convicted of rape, sexual assault, and threatening to kill. Not only for the safety of the survivors, but for the necessity of those trials being fair, he had been granted a legal tool that's often seen used for victims. He was sentenced to a total of 11 years, to be served concurrently with his minimum sentence of 17 years. At one point, he took off his glasses, holding them in his hand to emphasize as he yelled at the judge, You're so full of shit, mate. You have no reason to convict me. You're full of shit. Jesse Shane Kempson was born and raised in Wellington, the capital of New Zealand. After his parents divorced when he was nine and his mother moved overseas, he was left to be raised by his grandfather and father, who eventually remarried. There were allegations of childhood sexual abuse, and one incident involving a school suspension after an eight-year-old Jesse threatened to hurt staff and other student with knives. A social worker was quoted during the event as saying that he was severely disturbed, showing suicidal intentions. He continued to have issues with authority and also substance abuse, During an interview with police, he told the officer about his drinking problem and how maybe it had been something he picked up from his father, who'd also drank until blackout. As he got older, he became more estranged from his family. After college, he got by working as a laborer or bartender, never some prestigious manager in an oil company. He spent a few years in Sydney, but eventually returned to Auckland. He didn't have a violent past on paper, just a drunk driving conviction in New Zealand and a few arrests for drunken disorderly behavior. When sentencing him, the judge made note of his childhood and the difficulties most likely brought on from such an unideal upbringing. That, however, was no excuse for the callous and malicious way he had conducted himself. It seems as if it had only been a matter of time before the narcissistic rage in him would explode with error and entitlement. He was ice cold to the bone, a danger to society, who had made mistakes that he could not take back choices out of a selfish carelessness for human life. Guilt, it seemed, had not yet made its way onto his radar. 
Now he would have more than enough time to wait for it. Before the trial, Grace's mother channels her grief into purpose by starting the Love Grace campaign. Inspired by her daughter's love of handbags, Jillian fills them with basic toiletries and tiny luxuries like perfume and makeup items, and donates them to local domestic violence abuse charities in Essex and other parts of England, having already helped over 7,000 women and counting. During 2020, the campaign began also donating hundreds of care packages to health workers, patients, and caretakers. The giving nature is a perfectly fitting way to embody everything about who Grace was. After her graduation, Grace had cut off several inches of her long brown hair as a donation to the Little Princess Trust, a charity that provides real hair wigs free of charge to children that have lost their own as a result of cancer treatments. Shortly after returning to the UK post-trial, David Mullane was diagnosed with cancer himself. On November 19th of 2020, the Love Grace Campaign Facebook page would post a photograph of the whole family, smiling together in summery attire, sharing that their lives were now absent of two. Looking back on all of our memories together can be difficult, but the hardest ones are the new ones without you that just push us over the edge. Thank you for all your messages of condolence. We are heartbroken by the loss of David, and he will be deeply missed. David had been tenacious for his little girl, never missing a conference or a court date, the representation of who the defense attempted to portray her as had not touched what he knew to be true, that Grace was a loving, kind, and intelligent young woman, wildly independent and free, but also quiet and still. Sometimes he would catch himself stopping in the middle of the living room, the breeze hitting the curtains just so. He could hear her music playing, see her sitting there at her easel, not a care in the world except for watercolors and waking dreams. Right before she'd left for Peru, Grace would share her last painting online. A black and white skull dripping down with an array of melting rainbow watercolor. The caption beneath it, Two can keep a secret if one of them is dead. What seemed clever is now almost strange and foreboding. Song lyrics like an omen. A tinge too true with the sting of a joke the universe made that you aren't quite in on forcing you to make what's left over into enough. When David was asked what he thought of his daughter's choices in her dating life, he'd said that they were none of his business. He didn't believe children tell their parents everything, nor should they necessarily. He stressed that what happened to Grace shouldn't deter anyone from flying the nest and following their dreams. And indeed, a lesson does give way eventually through the knotted strands of tragedy, one that is not for the frail of heart. Not that life is to be feared, but instead that life is painfully short. Cruel and unpredictable, yes, but Grace knew that if you do it right, you always want it all. You always want more. You can live inside a single moment. Grace was the human version of the music up and the windows rolled down, letting the wind make you feel free, finding a way to feel infinite in the fleeting. Grace was the one who always showed up for the birthdays and answered the 3 a.m. phone calls for the big questions that kept her friends up at night. She was that daughter who always rang just to chat, the family member who pulled out her phone to catch the moment. She didn't mind sharing the spotlight, but she often took it, effortlessly and humble, goofy and brilliant and beautiful in that innocent way, when you're so young you think you'll live forever. Grace loved as ferociously as she could, and left a liveliness behind in the memory she made with everyone who mattered to her. The nostalgia like an echo piercing the contours of reality and confronting its harshness for a split second, still making her here, somehow. Like the places she traveled, Grace held vast landscapes within her, versions of herself she wanted to nurture all at once. You have to keep the rules simple as often as possible. Dance when you want to. Love deeply when you get the chance. Find what makes you feel alive and do it as much as you can. Open yourself to new worlds. Make it mean something. There are miracles and there are moments, and sometimes they are the same thing, skipping briefly like a record between the tangles of pauses and tornadoes, humming in the background, among grocery lists and stop signs, is the soundtrack to your life. 
somewhere, you're always singing along.